I am here with Paige Bailey. Hi. Uh Paige, thank you so much for joining us at ML for All. Thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here. So I may have just stolen Paige straight off the stage after her talk. Happily stolen. <laughs> I am happily stolen. <laughs> and and your talk was called Kill Deep Math, right? Yes. What, where did that title come from? The title is an homage to Brett Victor, um, who is Worry Dream on Twitter's Kill Math essay. Um, which is all about taking complex mathematical notation and abolishing that um, because it's it's obfuscated, it's hard to understand, um, and explaining mathematics in beautiful, kind of straightforward, hands-on, and very visual ways. I think that's a really appropriate title because Paige very much succeeded at that goal for yes. your talk. Mission accomplished. <laughs> <laughs> so. I've never had anyone ever break down fast Fourier transform for me, and that is something that I've really struggled with, so it's super related to you actually using that as an example of why people get so caught up on like how scary math is when it comes to stuff like this, but I didn't expect to have it explained to me so effectively using a smoothie metaphor. Yes. Where did that come from? So it was mostly um, whenever, I, whenever I try to uh, do a talk, I always start with explaining it to my mom. Um, so she was uh, she was an algebra teacher for a long time, um, and never uh, never really kind of delighted with calculus or linear algebra or any of that. Um, but when I was describing um, kind of the concept of taking a, a complex wave, so something that looks like a very um, very complicated squiggle um, into constituent parts, uh, she was just like, "Oh, so it's like a cake," and I was like. <laughs> And I was like, okay, well, that's fine. But then thinking about it in, in terms of a smoothie. So um, the, the way that an FFT works is that you would have um, something, um, something that's complex, that's been mixed, um, like a smoothie. And then you would be able to apply a filter and kind of turn it back into its constituent parts. So a strawberry or a banana and a glass of milk, whatever. Um, so that, that I thought was an effective, an effective use of What's the word for it, the SAT word? Metonymy? I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was very helpful to me. I'm sure it was helpful for the rest of the audience. Thank you. I feel like maybe I can start looking at the Wikipedia page now, even though it's still really scary. Dude, the, <laughs> I, I, again, mathematical notation. It's not friendly to anybody. Like, I did my, um, my undergrad degree was in geophysics. And it's still, like, geophysics lives and breathes by physics, lives and breathes by waves. Um, and it still looks complex. Yeah. Well, hopefully we've demystified a little bit at yep. ML4, and yes. you've definitely been part of that, so we appreciate Excellent. that. Thank you. Moving over to something that I know that you're really passionate about, which a lot of us also share this passion, is mm -hmm. ethics in machine learning. And yes. You didn't really talk about that in your talk, but I've seen in other talks you've given, you've covered that. Mm -hmm. Where did that kind of passion come from, and, and, and what's like, what are a couple of things people can start thinking about when it comes to machine learning ethics? Right. So I did. So I had a short stint as an undergrad as a sociology major, and actually ended up um, getting a, getting a, an additional um, additional degree um, for sociology, which was uh, fun, but but also kind of the weirdest degree combination that you can think of: geophysics and sociology. Um, but the, the entire basis of it was being able to understand how um, you can spot patterns, statistical patterns, um, in people and in demographic locations and, and, and those sorts of things. And there are so often that you have features in your machine learning algorithms that correspond to things like race or things like gender or um, you know, socioeconomic status, which is also a proxy for race. And if you don't remove those, then those groups, those marginalized groups, are less likely to have things like loans or, or credit cards or anything of that nature, and that's heartbreaking. Um, so I, I ended up, um, there are a couple of unconferences that were sponsored by NumFocus that I was able to attend recently. One called the Diversity and Inclusion in Scientific Computing Unconference, and then the other one was the R OpenSci Unconference. And both of, in both of them, I ended up working on projects. The first was a set of questions that you can ask as you're architecting an algorithm. So where did my data come from? Is it from a reputable source? Do I know that there is any bias in this data? Would the people who, um, whose data this is, would they feel comfortable having it used in an experiment? 
Um, if I look at the distributions of, of predictions for different demographic groups, um, are any preferentially less likely um, um, or, or are any preferentially impacted negatively by these results? Um, and I'd never seen a collection of questions like that. So it was, it was really important for me to create it. Um, and then the, the second one, I focused on creating um, ethical machine learning and, and proxy bias vignette for R. Um, and I actually have a guy who's, uh, who's translating it into Python, which is kind of cool. That's awesome. Yeah, and he, he's made a pull request. So like the, the Wednesday, um, the Wednesday uh, getting started with open source thing, like that's gonna be the pull request that I show how to approve. That is so cool and yeah. I'm so glad that you're trying to make this stuff more accessible. You're not trying to terrify people by saying like, don't ever do machine learning, but you're arming them with just some really great starter questions. Yeah. And it's very heartening to know that people are starting to contribute that to that as well. Thank awesome. you. And, and having like quantitative ways to point and say like, okay, well, this doesn't look right. Like, let's talk about removing this bias. I think will be really helpful. Right, for sure. One thing that I found really helpful was that someone once said to me, you know, machines by themselves aren't necessarily capable of bias, um, you know, by themselves, but as soon as you introduce any kind of data around humans in general, it's mm -hmm. just, that is that is the huge risk that we have. And so mm -hmm. it's we know it's in the data, and so mm -hmm. that's exactly where we can start looking, but yeah. a lot of people don't really appreciate that until it's too late, so it's great. Absolutely, and one of the things that troubled me the most is that whenever I was talking about doing this on Twitter, um, there were a couple of people who responded with, but what if race is my best predictor? And I was just like, oh, honey. Like, <laughs> That's the wrong question to yeah. be asking. Yeah, so, um, so you know, more, um, more soon, but hopefully, hopefully we'll be able to, to move past that. And, yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. And, thank you for And having, having such insightful answers as well. Thank you, um, thank you for having me. Now let's get back to ML for all. <laughs> Thanks, guys.